Welcome to Entrepreneurs in Healthcare. I've come to realize that entrepreneurship discussions are long overdue in medicine. I'm pairing up with voices from healthcare that value entrepreneurship and that are willing to come on the screen with me and hold a discussion. I'm hoping that hosting these conversations will open up pathways to making progress in medicine and not making entrepreneurship a bad word. Join along on the series as we dissect entrepreneurship, healthcare, and everything in between. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Entrepreneurs in Healthcare. Sitting across from me virtually is Dr. Tiffany Moon, who requires no introduction for some of you, but I'm still going to have her introduce herself before we get to the question of the hour. So, Tiffany Moon, can you please let us know a little bit about who you are? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Tiffany Moon. I am an anesthesiologist by training. I live here in Dallas. Um, Some of you may have seen me on social media or on a little TV show called The Real Housewives of Dallas. Um, I am CEO of a wine company and aromasthesia candle company. And right now, my newest venture is planning the inaugural Lead Her Summit, which is going to be in November here in Dallas. I love that. And I love the succinctness of it. You've really mastered the art of uh, marketing and PR. We're going to get to the next question, but you've clearly already answered it. Entrepreneurship in healthcare, good or bad? Absolutely necessary. Okay. Please tell us more. (laughs) <laughs> I was just talking to my friend yesterday because there are some changes going on at work because I am still employed by a large academic medical center where I have been working for, gosh, almost 13 years now. So I'm still in the thick of it, but I have my side projects. And I was telling her, I don't think I could be full time at that job because it would slowly suck my soul dry. <laughs> and um, I can elaborate on that or not. I think most of your listeners probably already understand many of the reasons why I feel that way. But the side hustles that I have, if that's what you want to call them, give me the ability to exercise different parts of my brain, connect with people outside of medicine, and just grow myself in ways that practicing medicine never could. I love that. I love that as an entrepreneur that does exactly that. Um, And I don't know that everybody's going to understand that unless they either possess that entrepreneurial drive or have actually done it for themselves. So with that said, how do you think that you developed an entrepreneurial drive? Gosh, I don't think I had an entrepreneurial bone in my body um, until COVID hit. And I kind of saw what was going on with doctors and I had a little bit more time on my hands because when COVID hit, we canceled all the elective surgeries, Um, but we were still doing trauma surgeries and cancer surgeries that needed to go on. I found myself with a little extra time. And I just thought to myself, like if the whole world is coming to an end and this is all I know, Perhaps I should develop some skills that I can use in case medicine doesn't work out for me. Really, it was sort of a contingency plan. And I have to credit my husband with a lot of this because he's an entrepreneur and I kind of saw what he was doing and he helped guide me into this next phase of my life. So I had a good role model. Oh, that's amazing. So Let's quickly dissect the different entrepreneurial ventures that you have just for interest. I'm sure everybody's super interested in how you started with them. First and foremost um, is the uh, Real Housewives franchise. So how did you land a role in the Real Housewives? 
<laughs> um, I never thought I would do reality TV. They actually asked me to do it several years before I finally said yes. But I was introduced to the show because Dallas, even though it's a big city, I kind of feel like it's small. You see the same people at all the events year after year. And one of my good friends had been on the show since season two. And I had gone to several events where they were filming and you'd have to sign this little waiver, you know, saying that you agreed to being filmed as part of the production. Um, and I I guess I caught an eye of one of the producers and they sort of said to her like, Hey, who's that friend of yours, Tiffany? Like what's she do? What's she all about? She seems interesting. Can you ask her if she wants to be on the show? So my friend Deandra asked me, I think after season three, and I was like, absolutely not. Like, that's crazy. I have no interest. I was a um, full time at the hospital with twin toddlers at home. The first time she asked me. So I was like, are you smoking crack? Like, absolutely not. And then she asked me again, and I was like, you know what? Like, I'll take the call, right? And I always tell people, like, take the call because you never know what might happen. And even when I took the call, I think with the producers, I was like, just so you know, I'm not really that interested, but I promised my friend I'd take the call. Like, and I, I just learned about the show. One of the things that I didn't understand was one, they're not just like a camera crew following you around all the time. Like all the filming is scheduled. They're like Tuesday, we're going to film you from this time to this time. Saturday night, there's a dinner party from this time to this time. So that was one thing that I did not understand. Um, and the second thing that kind of, I think, pushed me to do it was um, it's only 12 weeks. And I was like, shit, it's only 12 weeks. Like I went to medical school. I went to residency. Like that's the long haul. I was like 12 weeks. I can film for 12 weeks. And I think that's what like sold it to me that I could have this new experience, this thing that I may not be offered again. Like how often is it that, you know, Bravo TV is knocking on your door. And I was like, you know what, for 12 weeks, I can do anything. <laughs> Did it? Are most of the women on your specific show actually housewives? Yes. On Dallas, I don't think that the majority of my castmates had jobs outside the home. Not to say that, you know, a homemaker is not an important job, but most of them did not work, were married to well-to-do men who, you know, provided for them. Um, and that, I think, created some of the tension for my season when I went on, because when I came on, I was working full time as a doctor and raising twin toddlers. And one of my other classmates, I don't think had ev ever had a job in her entire life um, and had a full time nanny. And I kind of wanted to ask her, like, what the hell do you do all day? You know, like, no, seriously, but I can tell you she wakes up and has breakfast and then you know, hangs out with the kids, drives them to school, like goes to Pilates, goes to the grocery store, has a two hour lunch with her sassy girlfriends, does a little bit of shopping, goes back to carpool, you know, and I'm just like, oh, wow, like we are not the same. <laughs> Is I, I admittedly have not watched it. Clearly, I need to because there's no, please don't clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Is I'm assuming this is someone that is not a friend that you're describing. No, is. no. I went on the show actually with real. In retrospect, now I was really naive, um, but I actually went on thinking that the show would be fun and I would make a lot of new girlfriends and Bravo was going to pay for us to go on this fabulous international trip because I absolutely love traveling. And now in retrospect, I'm like, God, I was stupid. <laughs> Oh, so so that did not happen. Did you not go on trips or did you go on trips and need to pay for them? No, we filmed during the pandemic, which nobody could have predicted. So our, you know, Bravo entices you and says, you know, we send you the whole crew cast on a international trip on our dime and all that. And I was like, cool, that's amazing. You know, they had gone to Thailand like the year before and like the year before. And I just, you know, love traveling. That was one of the things that like sold me. I made a pro con list when I was deciding like a true nerd. Um, and our, uh, international trip was to Oklahoma. We drove in an RV because we filmed during the pandemic and we rented this cabin and went like Bigfoot hunting. And I was like, this is the lamest shit ever. Like, this is not what I signed up for, but you know, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me because being on Real Housewives certainly opened a lot of doors for me and I'm grateful 
I, you know, did have some good times. I'm not sitting here like, wow, wow, it all sucked. Like there were some really great times. Um, but overall, I think I just, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Wow. I love that. I love the honesty there. Um, I'm assuming that you're no longer doing it. Yeah. I only did one season and then I told them like, I'm not doing that again because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And I was like, not with these clowns. And I, and I was like, I'm not doing it again. And then a few weeks after I told them I'm not doing it again, they said that they're not filming a season six. So there is no Real Housewives of Dallas, like currently being filmed or whatever. Once in a while I'll get tagged on social media. That's like, bring Tiffany back. We need her back on our TV or a rumor that they're, you know, starting to cast for season six. And I'm like, that's news to me. Nobody's called me. <laughs> wow. Super interesting. And what about the friend that you had going in? Or did, do you have, oh, her yeah, we're out? still friends. Oh, yeah. good. I have the same friend I had going. Dr. Moon's sound freezes friend. momentarily. Okay. You, you froze up there. So I'll just say that you have the same friend going in as going out. Okay. Um, you know what the next question was going to be, and you actually answered it was, that whether you think, I mean, I guess it's kind of a rhetorical question, but if you think that it helped being on Real Housewives helped with marketing your brand. Yeah, I mean, for sure. People who have been on Housewives, like, you know, Bethany Frankel, like maybe made her entire brand off the, you know, housewives back. So certainly it helped. Um, I mean, I think I could have done it without, um, I did not make my candle company or my wine company, like, because I was going to be on housewives. Sometimes you see this desperation from the housewives that they need a storyline or they need a product to promote because they're going to be on TV. And I think the audience is very savvy and they can see through that. I was already doing these things, um, before I was on housewives, but certainly we had a boost in sales. Um, when in 2021, when season five aired, like my sales were higher. Like that's a fact. I love that. That's amazing. Um, you know, you, you showed a little bit in our interview this, but, um, if anybody that's listening follows you on Instagram, they probably already know something that I personally really appreciate, not only appreciate about you, but also connect with you with, and that's your self-deprecation. Um, you're just, you're not afraid to make fun of yourself. Um, I really love that. Did that, first of all, is that something you do in real life as well? Or is that more sort of like an Instagram thing? No, I mean, who, who I am on Instagram is who I am in person. And I think people who know me in real life know that, um, the self-deprecating humor is just that, like, if you can't make fun of yourself, if you take yourself way too seriously, I can't be friends with those people. Um, I just, I don't know. Like, I think it's okay to be funny and to show your weaknesses and, fart in front of people. Like, it's just not that serious. Some people take themselves so seriously and like over filter every single photo Photoshop. And now I'm just like, whatever, send it out. Like I just made a TikTok yesterday and I was supposed to be mouthing something, but I didn't say the words correctly. And the old me would have reshot that until the mouth matched the sound perfectly. But I was like, I don't have time. Just send it out. They'll get the gist of it. It'll be fine. I love that about you. And I, I believe that that's how you are in real life too. Um, and I'm actually excited to see you at the conference since I'm speaking there. We're going to talk about this conference really uh, soon. In fact, let's actually segue to that because it has to do with some of the next questions that I had. Um, the conference, first of all, it's the first time that you're throwing a conference. Yes. I must have been smoking some crack back in January of this year. Um, what had happened was I'm turning 40 this year and I was sort of like, oh, I, I just want to do something big. You know, I don't want to keep doing the same things that I've been doing. And I was listening to these podcasts and it was all new year, new you. What would you do if you weren't afraid? And I just thought over the last couple of years, I've learned so much about being an entrepreneur and business, marketing, social media, negotiation, all that stuff. And I'm like, how come nobody taught us this stuff in medical school or residency. Like I didn't go to a single class about any of this. And I kind of had to learn it on my own. And a lot of women in my life have helped me along the way. And I thought, what if I built a conference where other female entrepreneurs could come and just like learn from each other? 
because we all have areas of expertise. For example, you're talking about social media because you've built this amazing platform and you know something about how to cultivate social media. And I thought, I'm just going to invite my friends, their leaders in their respective fields, and just ask them to talk about what they know. And the rest of us can learn and be inspired and be empowered and just make these connections to level up in our lives. Like, how do I take what you just said and bring it back and apply it to my own life so that I can level up personally and or professionally? So I started putting the conference together in like late February, early March. We made a website in April, April. April, we opened up registration and it's literally just like trial by fire every single day. That's wonderful. Um, now you've got some really great women that are speaking at your conference. One of them is, is Crystal from the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, um, mm -hmm. which I have seen. Um, I don't know if I should, you know, be proud of that or not, but Hey, it's no, a franchise. We really love it. Right. It's a little escapism. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Totally. Nothing wrong with that. Um, how how did you meet Crystal? And if you know off the top of your head, what is she going to speak about? We'll be right back. Did you know we have multiple series already available to watch or listen to inside of our series section? Check out the second season of Conversations with Shem, starring as host the legendary author of The House of God himself, Dr. Samuel Shem. I've watched you unfold too in your writing. I know it's a terrible burden and you'll you'll get shat on, but it, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a good time. Yeah. If we answer that question and the answer is, yes, we value money, then we're doing everything just right right now. Oh, because the food is really good, that the hospital's really good. Healthcare workers have been you know, always stressed, but of course, above and beyond. At this age. To learn. Yes, the disparities still exist. People in the C-suite, the corporate people, they don't care. To them, doctors are just employees. And that's what people have really responded to, the authenticity. All I really wanted was to come to work and feel like I was rowing in the same direction as everybody else. Like, you could be a doctor, you could be someone who works in a parking lot for the hospital. It is not uncommon for people to put aside their personal life. I, you know, I could never speak like that. But we are not listening to the why. How are you working to co-produce solutions? And he said, all well and good, Dr. Vonnegut, but if the dollars work, nothing else matters. You know, when I studied medical school, I was the only person who looked like me in my medical school class. Something about the struggles of men and friendship sort of as they age. And people hate it when I say this, like, you're just scaring me. I can't do anything about this. And I had my threadbare uh, blue blazer and they all had these thousand dollar suits. Tearing something down in order to get to what's real and important. Because we had to march across the bridge, one of the biggest marches ever. Uh, they would only pay me half of what they were paying me now. But it's true, whether <laughs> I tell you or not. No, you don't have any choice. I need to promise you that it's not over. I call my wife and say, I need, I need new clothes. Good connection is good medicine. That's the one phrase I've come up in my 76th year, I think. Check it out on doctorsonsocialmedia.com slash series. Now back to the show. How, how did you meet Crystal? And if you know off the top of your head, what is she going to speak about? Um, I met Crystal because of Housewives. She actually reached out to me because I was the like first Asian American housewife across all the franchises. Um, and I, I believe she was the second. So she kind of reached out to me just to talk and get some advice about filming and some interpersonal conflicts that she had with some of her cast members. And we just, you know, you meet somebody in life sometimes and you just click right away especially now that we're older. It's not like when you're young and you kind of meet all different kinds of people. Now it's like the minute I talked to her, I just felt like we had an understanding of each other. We're both Chinese. We have very traditional Chinese backgrounds, but both married non-Chinese people. Um, and I don't know, like she has a brother. I have a brother. Her sister, um, one of the people in her family, I forgot it's a sister 
in law or her, her half sister is an anesthesiologist. So she was like, Oh, I know what you deal with as an anesthesiologist. And we just like immediately understood each other and had a mutual respect for one another. Um, so when it was time for me to think of speakers for the conference, asking crystal to come was natural to me because she owns like a hundred million dollar coconut water brand that she runs with her brother, Jeff, who's hilarious by the way, you might've seen him on the show. Um, they own the coconut farms in um, Southeast Asia where the coconuts are grown and have all this like vertical integration. They're at Costco. I buy it on Amazon. It's like on subscribe and save. So there's this little cocktail um, alcoholic drink that I like to make. <laughs> so yeah, she's coming to talk about the business of branding. And I think we're probably going to have a little housewives panel because um, I have Nicole Martin, who's an anesthesiologist from uh, Real Housewives of Miami, and Gertie, who is an event planner but has been named like one of the top wedding planners in like Vogue and all these, you know, big magazines. And then we have um, maybe two other housewives that haven't confirmed based on their schedule. Um, but I don't want this to turn into like a Bravo con. You know, that's not what this is. Um, these women happen to be real housewives, but they also happen to be mothers and entrepreneurs. In the case of Gertie, a cancer survivor, you know, like they've been through a lot. So this isn't like some sort of fluffy housewives panel. Like I really want them to talk about their personal brands and maybe how housewives have has helped or hurt their brand. I love that. Um, I live in Jersey and in my town specifically, um, there have been a few housewives that have been on the show. And the most recent one was Jackie Goldschneider. Um, and she, you know, she does a lot also with her brand. I really look up to her because she, um, she I, I believe officially she's a housewife, but she does write um, and she's been, I don't really watch the New Jersey Housewives, but she's in general just seems to be like a classy character um, and is building up her brand based on some of her own sort of like health issues from the past. Um, so that's super interesting. Uh, wow, what an interesting lineup, because I know there's also other women that are speaking and everything, but I didn't know about the panel. I'm sure people that are going to be listening, um, it's going to pique their interest. Uh, <laughs> when, when is it? The summit is November 8th through 10th. So the programming starts Friday at 8 a.m. So you should probably get there Thursday night. So it's all day Friday, ending with a happy hour, all day Saturday. Saturday, there's a glam gala. Um, so kind of like a wedding reception level, dancing, DJ. I'm going to be giving away a Birkin at the gala on Saturday oh night, gosh. like raffling it off. I know everyone's losing their mind. Um, and then Sunday, the programming is more of like health, wellness, meditation. So we have rooftop yoga, a meditation session, a few keynotes, and then it ends at noon on Sunday. So it's pretty comprehensive programming. You know, a lot of people were like, wow, your first summit and it's like three days long. And I'm like, you know what, go big or go home. Like, I just I didn't want to do a one day thing. And I think that when you're there multiple days, that's when you form the real meaningful connections with the other attendees. I feel like one day where you kind of come in and like leave the same day, try to get home in time for dinner, it feels feels more corporate-y. And I wanted this to have more of like a retreat, you know, sleepaway camp feel. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, I envisioned this in my head. And then I sort of am every day working towards making it happen. And I always tell people that they need to take imperfect action because if you wait until everything's perfect by then you've already like missed the boat. So I tell people every day, like, this is me uh, walking the walk from talking the talk. Totally. I love that. And we're going to have to have you back maybe even in our side venture series to talk about um, your being, you know, a conference organizer, especially if you plan on having it a second time after the first, we'll see if it's a success. Or we'll not. see how this goes. We'll yeah. see how my mental health is in November. Totally. Uh, that's, you know, another question I have is actually, um, isn't it very pricey to nowadays to host in-person events? Yeah. 
Yep. I'm so glad you asked because I'm getting a lot of questions and pushback from people. That's like your base ticket. The silver ticket is $3,000. Like, are you insane? And I'm like, no, let me show you the invoices that I have from people to put this together. Um, the hotel, you know, all, to have all the conference spacing. The other thing is we're feeding people six full meals because one of my pet peeves is going to a conference and they don't feed you. And I cannot be present and learn and engage when I'm hangry. Like I got to eat. Like I paid thousands of dollars to go to a conference last November. It was like $6,000 and they fed us not at all. So it was just up to you to break during whichever speaker you weren't that curious about and like go and buy some stale chicken fingers or something. And I just, it, it was so weird to me. So for this conference, like, yes, it's pricey, but once you get there, like everything is taken care of. And I'm basically like not really making money on that base level ticket. Like I'm really for my inaugural conference, like I just want people to come, but I also need to cover my expenses. So with the hotel, the rooms, food and beverage, you know, um, I'm, uh, have hotel rooms for all of the speakers that I'm paying for. Um, it's just, it adds up. Like, I don't know what else to say, you know? Amazing. I, I love the honesty, honestly. Like, I think that should at the least draw in some guests that might be interested and might be worried about the price tag. Um, of course, if they can afford it, we wouldn't want anybody coming if they cannot afford it. And actually, SoMeDocs is offering a discount. So um, head on over to not only our website, but in the show notes, we will link um, the conference and you can get a small discount on the price um, and hopefully attend. Um, yeah. And I think that, listen, sometimes um, when we first begin a venture, uh, we need to kind of um, not make a ton of profit right away and kind of think of the long game and say, well, I'm trying this out. I'm going to do it. I need to get a lot of like the rah, rah and the marketing going. And then maybe next time, I don't know, maybe you can make like either a better deal with the vendors. I know that that's so difficult to make deals with these vendors Yeah. Um, or, you know, find a different way to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Kudos to you. Um, yeah. How do you see yourself as a role model for women? Oh gosh. Um, we'll be right back. Hey everyone, Donna Coriel from SomiDocs. SomiDocs has just newly released its side venture series. It joins a stellar lineup of other fabulous video and podcast series, including entrepreneurship and healthcare, SomiDocs conversations, and more. In fact, we're working with our members to create more interesting and unique shows to share with you. But if you're interested in side ventures, we do also have a Facebook group that's been built just for doctors that are curious on what else. Check out the Facebook groups that we manage at doctorsonsocialmedia.com slash our dash Facebook dash groups. I'll see you there. Back to our show. Um, no. How do you see yourself as a role model for women? 10 years ago, when I was a junior faculty, I was really afraid to show the fullest side of myself, like my my whole self. I thought I had to be prim and proper and, you know, not post on social media or talk about my love of skincare, makeup and luxury handbags. I thought that people would take me less seriously. And in, in many ways they did when I started doing those things. But I think when you live small and like dim your light, it's, taxing on your mental health because you're like not showing all the sides of yourself. You're hiding yourself for what? Because you're afraid of what other people might say or think or whatever. And I just, I think you get to this point in your life where you're just like, F it, you know, like I'm just going to be myself. And if you don't like it, like don't follow, don't watch my content then, you know what I mean? But, um, I played small for, for many, many years of my life. And it wasn't until like around when the pandemic happened and I went into a deep, dark depression and was like, is this all like, is the world ending? And I never had a chance to do this. I never had a chance to do this. Like I've just been a good girl all my life. And, you know, then I did housewives then I started posting more on social media. I really, you know, um, 
took my entrepreneurial spirit and decided to make something of it. And, and that's what I want to tell women to do. Like whatever it is that you want to do, like seriously, just do it. And you cannot not do it because you're afraid of what other people might think or say. Oh, I love that so much. And also, I mean, those of you that are listening or watching this that already know Tiffany Moon, um, you'll understand this, that you're actually talented in what you do. Like, I truly mean that um, in that, you know, anybody can really go into Instagram and like create reels, but you actually have a knack um, and I say that because when the reels actually come up on my feed, I laugh out loud many times. So <laughs> before we came on, I tried to download some of your reels, but I guess you've selected the non-downloadable way of 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 posting them. I oh, want there's a reason for that, but but I'm I'm happy to send them to you. But other people were downloading them and then oh. posting them as like, like their own content. Wow. Yeah. And then one company, um, company, I say the word company, uh, took one of my reels of purses and is putting ad spend behind it to sell counterfeit bags on the internet. Mm -hmm. So I stopped letting people download, although there's all these apps. If you really want to download a content, you know, you can't really um, prevent someone totally. from downloading your content. Yeah. But yeah, that's why I stopped. Doing that. Oh, I love that. That's a great entrepreneurial lesson, actually. Um, I think when you make it big enough, Enough, people will use that power understandably because also you know the whole point of Instagram a lot of times they even let you do that right they let you sequence and they let you do whatever the other word is on on Instagram so that you're kind of doing it with another person but you don't actually need to get their permission you could just use that reel to piggyback off of it um and I I mean I've read up a lot on this but there's also like the fair use laws and things like that where you can take a reel and sort of not necessarily a reel, but let's say like a tweet and you can talk about it and then it makes it okay. And it makes it not, um, copywritten. So, um, wow. But, but that's really frustrating. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I guess the, the lesson here for the listeners is, you know, as an entrepreneur, the rules change all the time. You feel like people are taking advantage of you or taking your intellectual property and trying to benefit off of it. And it sucks and it's frustrating. And it's just one of the things that happens and you kind of do whatever you need to, like not letting, you know, people download your reels anymore. And then you just keep going, but it's going to happen. And I think um, it's good to set the expectation that there's going to be those hurdles and roadblocks so that when they happen, you're not like, oh, what the hell? Like, you know, like just expect that things are going to happen because they certainly will. Totally. What's your favorite reel on Instagram? Speaking of Instagram. Like that I made? Yes. Oh, I don't know. This is the other thing because, you know, your listener base is probably interested in social media. But as long as I've been doing social media, I have no idea what's going to hit and what's not. Like sometimes I have this one that I think is so funny. And when I'm filming it, I'm laughing out loud. Like I'm having fun filming it. Like me and my assistant were like cracking up, like I'm going to pee my pants. And then we put it out and it's like, meh, like it gets like 100,000, 200,000 views is whatever. Okay. Then we uh, shoot some stupid stuff and I almost don't even post it because it's so stupid, but then I don't have anything else to post that day. And I'm always like, if it's 80% good, like just send it out. And then it goes viral, gets like millions of views. And I'm like, I almost didn't even post that because there was one I did about Crocs. And I'm just like, these are the stupidest, ugliest shoes. I own like four pairs, right? Um, Because I have to take the dogs to go potty and stuff. And they're the easiest ones. I don't wear them in the hospital though, because I do trauma and those shoes have holes in them. I'm like, <laughs> ew, disgusting. Um, And it was like, how to style Crocs. And then I put them in the garbage can. And then all the comments were like, um, finally, someone styled them correctly. And then somebody else was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Those are the best shoes ever. And then somebody else was like real triggered. And they're like, why don't you throw yourself in the trash can too? And I was like, sir, it is not that serious. Um, but like that one, it was so stupid. And it got like 10 million views. I feel like you're opening your own like 
the real Instagram of Dallas or something, right? With the drama yeah. that's in your comment section. Oh, the comment section. We could have a whole nother hour podcast on the comment section, but we don't have time for that today. I mean, I used to read the comments and I still kind of flip through them sometimes. Um, but, you know, like who, I always say, who is the person making these comments? First of all, they have like four followers and no profile picture or like a dog. And, you know, I'm like, who is this person? Like, why are you listening? to this person. It's like a nobody. It's not like someone on our level or that you would have in your friend group or whatever. It's like some crazy person. Maybe it's a bot. Also Brooke yeah. Shields. Also Brooke Shields, I think in the Tonys or whatever it was recently that Angelina Jolie took a picture in that gray velvet dress with her, um, her daughter. Uh, Brooke Shields wore like some yellow dress and paired it with yellow Crocs. So just letting you know. <laughs> I did not. I that. did not know that. Yeah. I have not been keeping up on the fashion news lately, but I'm for sure going to Google Brooke Shields yeah. Crocs. I don't know. There must have been a joke behind it. No, I mean, a another passion of mine is fashion. You you know, I, I post a lot about outfits and things like that. And um, Anne Hathaway was doing like a red carpet event with Bulgari and wore a Gap white dress like a white shirt dress from the gap which sold out in like five minutes because oh, i tried cool. to buy it um and it, it, this is what i say about fashion like it doesn't need to be expensive and you just have to put your own twist on fashion you know i don't follow trends um but i have like i would say a, a classic style with a twist you know something that's all your own but when you wear it you stand proudly and people take note of you um yeah, no, I love fashion. I could do a whole nother hour about fashion. <laughs> I freaking love that. I love that as someone that loves design and art and uniqueness, really. It it helps us to stand out. And again, that's part of branding and part of why you're so successful, clearly being such a smart person because you're an anesthesiologist and accomplished, but then also being on social media and kind of self-deprecating and humor. It's just such a really cool mix. Last question of the hour, and we must have you back, especially to talk about any of these topics and specifically about the candle and the candles and the wine, which we didn't even talk about. Um, did I get the right wine? I feel like you said yeah, wine, wine and okay. candles. <laughs> yeah. Wine and candles. Love it. We definitely need to have you back on side ventures, but um, how do you come up with your ideas? For business or like or a for real social. For oh, it's just life. Like something will happen, you know, when you have a conversation with someone and, and then I'm like, how do we turn that into a reel? Like last Christmas, you know, there's this elf on the shelf thing that I have to do. I feel like it's one of the things because my kids came home from school from kindergarten one day and they were like, so-and-so has an elf. And I'm like, what the hell is an elf on a shelf? Like we didn't celebrate Christmas growing up. So I don't even know what that is. So then of course I Google it and it's a stupid elf. You have to like move it every night. And, you know, by the time the kids are in bed, I have a glass of wine, answer a couple emails, watch some Instagram reels myself and pass out. I like forget to move the elf on the shelf. And so then I was like, let's make a reel about it. So there's a sound from white chicks or the Damon brothers. And he's like, move, bitch. And so <laughs> then I push the kids out of the way and like throw the elf across the room. And everybody was like, oh my God, that's so funny. And it's so relatable. I think that's the word. Like we have self-deprecating we talked about, but it's relatable because when moms watch that reel and they're like, oh, you know, I forgot to move the stupid elf last night. Like it, they see themselves in your reel. And, and I think my stuff that performs the best often is the funny stuff that's relatable because no matter what profession you are, what ethnicity, what religion, like all the stuff that so clearly divides us as a nation and as a community these days, when you see something funny that's relatable for a moment in time, we are all more similar than we are different. And I think that brings people together. Beautiful, beautifully said. And I so, so agree with that. It sounds like your children also are a part, like your whole family. I've seen your husband in them too, but they're a part of your creations too. I make them. <laughs> I'm like, if you want to go on beach vacation next week, Moonies. you will sit here, mouth these words and do as I say. Okay. Dr. Moon is a negotiator, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're happy to participate, but sometimes the kids are like, oh, mom. And I'm like, do you want to go to Chuck E. Cheese on Saturday or not? <laughs> you know? 
I you got to use what you have. I am not above bribery and negotiation. <laughs> That's good. Oh, so much wisdom picked up on this specific episode. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, join us for the conference in Dallas. Um, and uh, I will, again, have that linked in the show notes. Dr. Tiffany Moon will be there. A whole slew of amazing speakers will be there. You could check that out in the link. Um, I will be there. So I would love to meet you. I'd love to, I'm going to bring my um, mic. I'm going to hopefully do some podcasts there as well. We can do some lives. And I'm sure that Dr. Moon is going to be creating some things while there as well. Yeah, so. they're, everyone's going to need to sign a waiver when they come into the summit to say oh. that you uh, agree to be in some reels. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine if someone says no, that's going to no, be. No, I mean, I'm just kidding. I don't usually include anyone who doesn't want to be included, but yeah. Of course. Okay. Wonderful. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for hopping on and absolutely would love to have you back on the show. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks so much for listening. 